Today we're going to be talking about visualization, the art of telling the story of data through graphs, images, and other visual tools. You might think this is easy, but a large number of studies since the 1960s onward have shown that how we interpret images depends a lot on how the figure looks and how the brain works. Today we're going to be considering some of the key points that people have learned. Almost all of the images I will show you today come from the book Data Visualization, A Practical Introduction by Kieran Healy. Uh, you can look up the website, uh, which is listed on the screen. Kieran says that problems with images tend to come in three varieties. Some are strictly aesthetic, some are substantive, and some problems are perceptual. We're going to cover these three areas today. Basically, they come down to bad taste, bad data, and bad perception. Let's start with the issue of bad taste, which is perhaps the most straightforward to understand, although it's also one of the hardest to fix. Edward Tufte, one of the pioneers of this field, says that Graphical excellence consists of complex ideas communicated with clarity, precision, and efficiency. It gives the greatest number of ideas in the shortest time, with the least ink in the smallest space. That's the ideal we want to aim for. So consider this graph for a moment. Stop your video and ask yourself, what do I think of this graph? And how could I make it clearer? Even a quick look should tell you that this graph has a lot of junk. The 3D design makes it hard to figure out what numbers are associated with the bars. The shadows make this even more confusing. The labels are duplicated. The continents are listed to the side of the bars. So the legend at the top gives no additional information. The, the aged paper, the wood grain on the bars, and the fancy font all make the plot harder to read than it really needs to be. There is actually very little data in this plot, and it's not very complex, but it takes a lot of brain power to figure out what it means. Let's consider some other plots then. This one is by David McCandless who is well known for making clear and engaging graphics. On the x-axis, he shows the data score for various breeds of dog. That score is based on their uh, intelligence, uh, the cost of having them, longevity, the need for grooming, ailments, and appetite. On the, on the y-axis, he shows the popularity of the dog breeds. The various quadrants show things like dogs that are overrated or uh, overlooked treasures. Now, David could have plotted these with symbols, but he's instead used outlines of the dog breed, so it's very, very clear uh, what breed you're looking at. Most people look at this particular image and think that this plot is very easy to read and very engaging. But making nice plots is not a modern thing. This is a famous example by Charles Joseph Menard. He made this particular plot in 1861. This plot, which is uh, written in French, shows the fate of Napoleon's army as he invaded Russia in 1812. That's the story told by Tolstoy in his, uh, in his novel War and Peace. That particular campaign was waged over winter, so the light line shows the deaths of French soldiers as they moved towards Moscow. The black line shows their retreat. Although Napoleon took Moscow for a little over a week, the campaign was a disaster. Most of the French army died of cold and hunger. This image shows that fact very, very simply and clearly. But although simple is a good thing to aim for, there are always exceptions to the rule. This graph by Nigel Holmes is called Monstrous Costs, 
and had appeared in Time magazine in 1982. The information is clear. Expenditure on campaigns, political ones this time, not military, increased from $50 million in 1972 to $300 million in 1982. This graph breaks almost all of the rules, but it's still considered an excellent historical example. That's because it's memorable. Nigel could have given the same information in a simple bar chart, but no one would have remembered it. So the point here is that graphs can be striking as long as they're clear. In general, though, simple graphs will often get you further than this kind of image. A second challenge that we need to look at today is bad data. This occurs when a graph is technically correct, but it's misleading. The data don't actually say what the readers think the graph says. In 2016, the New York Times published a graph that was widely taken up on social media. This graph, shown here, seems to show an alarming decline in people who believe that it is important to live in a democracy. In countries as diverse as Sweden, the United States and New Zealand, it looks like democracy uh, was not being valued. A lot of people got very worried about this. Now, it's important to note that this graph is actually constructed really well. The X and the Y axes are understandable and clear. The points per decade are marked very clearly. There, there are even 95% confidence intervals uh, that show the range of variation in the data. So what's the problem here? Well, we need to ask, what do you think the survey question was? Perhaps you might think it's something like, uh, do you think it is essential to live in a democracy? With the percentage of yes answers plotted on that graph and no being the answer given by everyone else. If you thought this, uh, then you've got it wrong. Now that's certainly how everyone interpreted the graph, but it's not actually what the survey asked. Instead, the survey question asked people to rate the importance of living in a democracy on a 10-point scale, with one being not at all important and 10 being absolutely important. The graph we just looked at shows the percentage of people who gave a score of 10. It does not show the average score. So here's the survey data graphed in a different way. This version shows the average score that people gave to the question. Rate the importance of living in a democracy on a 10-point scale. Now the declines are still there, but the story now feels a little bit different. Most people actually rate the importance of living in a democracy really highly. The lowest score is about 7.5 out of 10. The Netherlands and Sweden show almost no decline at all. So yes, it's true that younger people are more inclined to value democracy less, and perhaps something that needs to be looked at. But it's not clear that there is actually a crisis, as the New York Times suggested. The point here is that your graphs need to give a fair representation of what the data is actually saying. The third challenge, and the one we're going to spend the most time on, is bad perception. This involves the myriad ways in which graphs can be either clear or confusing. The 3D plots are one of the big culprits in making graphs confusing. Stop your video for a moment and consider this graph. What are the values of the bars A, B, C and D? If you looked long and hard enough, you might have realised that they are just uh, values of 1, 2, 3 and 4. However, most people either get this wrong, 
or they take a while to figure it out. 3D plots are hard to read because of how we perceive geometric shapes and relationships. The bar isn't sitting against the back wall, so in your head you have to extrapolate from the bar to the lines, and that's really hard to do. In almost every case, including this one, 3D plots provide no additional information and make the existing information more confusing. It's best practice to avoid 3D graphs altogether. Stacked bar charts are another culprit. This graph is interesting because it doesn't have any junk content, but it's still very hard to read. It's actually relatively easy to follow the pattern of the category closest to the baseline. That's the one shown in purple. But what is the trend of the category in green? That's much harder to figure out. In general, relative comparisons, that is, comparing one trend against another, needs a stable baseline. It would probably be better to show this information as a line graph with one line for each of the four different categories. Well, how about this graph? Again, stop your video for a moment and ask yourself, what is the trend of the lines? The lines appear to be converging, right? Well, what about this graph? These lines probably don't look like they're converging uh, or perhaps not converging quite as much. The thing is, they're exactly the same graph. The one on the right is just a stretched out version of the graph on the left. The lines are actually exactly the same distance apart. Now you can see this if you look closely. The distance between the lines when x equals 0 is the same as the distance at x equals 8. If you take a ruler, you can see that it's in fact the same all the way uh, along the x-axis. But you probably don't see that. Your brain is telling you that the lines are converging, and so that's the interpretation you take from this particular graph. Here's another example. Which plot has random data? Most people say the plot on the left. In contrast, the plot on the right appears to have more structure or less randomness. Points are clustered together, so that's structure, right? Well, actually, the plot on the right is the random one. It's drawn from a random process uh, called a poisson. However, the plot on the left constrains each new point not to be too near already existing points. It's not random, it's structured. The key point here is that people see patterns where there often aren't any. That's why we need to do statistics, because our brain often fools us into thinking patterns exist when they really don't. Colours and shapes can also cause problems. Colours tend to stand out, while shapes don't. The third plot, the one in the middle, has one circle point. Stop your video and see if you can find it. OK, now try the fourth plot. It's much easier to see a point when it's presented in a different colour rather than a different shape. So that's the examples given in the, in the first two plots on the left. Basically, your brain likes colour better than it likes shapes. Now, don't get me wrong, shapes and colours can help where there are clear patterns. So if you look at the plot on the right, where the colours vary evenly with the x-axis. But if there are no patterns, and this is like the plot on the left, then using too many shapes and colours can just be confusing. The plot on the left is a really good example of this. You know, what does it mean? Basically, it's very hard for anyone to get a clear idea. This leads us to the idea of 
Gestalt rules. Now, Gestalt rules describe how your brain focuses on certain types of patterns rather than others. So consider this image for a moment. What do you see here? Most people say that they see three groups of circles. Okay, so what about now? Most people now say that they focus on the colored circles versus the non-colored ones. Of course, the underlying pattern is exactly the same. It's just what your eye gets drawn to that changes. What about this one? Again, most people say that the group on the right has colored shapes in contrast to the two groups on the left. If you look carefully, though, you can see that the pattern of the group in the middle is actually identical to the group on the right. But most people only realize that when they look very, very carefully at this plot. So what structure do you see here then? Most people put the circles together and the squares together. What about now? Most people say that they see a top row and a bottom row. And now? Most people say that they see a column on the right and a column on the left, with the right column standing out more. If we put all of this together, Gestalt rules basically say that colors are dominant over lines, and lines are dominant over shapes. There's no particularly good reason for this. It's just what our brain uh, does. If you make a plot with colors, lines, and shapes, your brain will notice the colors first, then the lines, then the shapes, assuming it notices anything beyond the colors at all. The point here is that when you're making graphs, you need to think really carefully about how your viewer is going to interpret that graph what is going to stand out, and what is going to fade back into the background. Here's a final example. What pattern do you see here? Is this clearer? Even if structure does exist, sometimes it's really hard to see. Here, lines make the trend stand out. Your brain doesn't have to work as hard to see the pattern. If you look a bit more closely, there are gaps in the line segments joining the circles. We perceive this as the circle lines passing underneath the lines joining the triangles. Now, of course, they don't. This is just a 2D image. It's not possible for one line to go under another. The point, though, is that our brain adds information to plots even when it isn't there. That's also important to keep in mind. In the final few slides, we're going to take a little bit of a look at colors. Look at these colors here and just think about them for a moment. What do these colors make you think or feel? Most people say that they see a scale going from high values on the left through to low values on the right. What about these ones? People often say that the top color scheme feels like it's zero in the middle and trends negative to the left and positive to the right. In contrast, people often say that the bottom color scheme feels different. The colors are clearly different, but in a more neutral way. They imply difference, but not necessarily movement or a trend. These sorts of unordered colors are commonly used in maps, where you might want to distinguish countries, for instance, but the colors don't mean anything more than that. The point here is 
don't just pick colors in an ad hoc way. It's really important to give your color scheme a bit of thought. Edges and contrasts are another interesting point. Often you can see edges better in monochrome images like the one on the right. There is a tendency now to use color in all images and graphs, largely because we can. Sometimes, though, a black and white image might convey information better than a color image. So, what do you see here? Again, stop the video for a moment and take a look at the two squares labeled A and B. What color are they? Most people say that square A at the top is dark, while square B in the middle is light, or something similar to that. That answer is wrong. Those two squares are actually exactly the same color. This is a famous image called the Checker Shadow Illusion by Edward Adelson. You can convince yourself that the squares are in fact the same color by drawing a line, again of the same color, up and down the checkerboard. That's what you're looking at on the right. There's no catch here. Those squares really are the same color. So what's the point here, apart from the acquisition of a new party trick? Colors that look identical to a computer don't necessarily look identical to your brain. So you need to choose your color scheme based on how people perceive it, based on what the computer tells you those colors are. Color schemes matter even more to a sizable proportion of our community. About 5% of the population, mostly men, are colorblind. That's 1 in 20 of the people who view your images. They don't see the image in the same way that you do. Now, there are many different types of color blindness, but the most common one is an inability to distinguish between red and green. If we consider this field of tulips, the image is going to look very different to a person with normal vision, that's shown there on the left, than it will to someone with color blindness, and that's uh, shown there on the right. Despite how common color blindness is, the world isn't exactly designed to accommodate people with it. Traffic lights are a prime example. Many people with color blindness can only distinguish traffic lights by their orientation. The light at the top means stop, the light at the bottom means go. which is all well and good until some idiot decides to install a traffic light horizontally. Unfortunately, we use the traffic light system in completely unrelated parts of our lives. In genetics, plots that show the expression of genes are a common example. These plots would be very hard to read if you were colorblind. To make things even more confusing, Upregulation is often plotted in red, while downregulation is shown in green, the opposite of what you might naturally expect. So best practice is not to use red and green as contrasting colors in images. The internet has lots of resources on color palettes that are colorblind safe. It's a good idea to use them. So how do we put all of this together? Here are what I think are some of the main take-home messages from what we've covered today. There's a real temptation to just sort of knock out a graph. In reality, you need to think very carefully about what you want your graph to say and what information you want to emphasize. Also, your brain interprets the world for you, sometimes in really weird and wonderful ways. You need to design your images with that in mind. You, you've got to think about how people are going to look at your images and how they're going to perceive them.
there are now lots of resources about how to make good graphs. There's, there's a lot of this on the internet, particularly around color schemes, but also resources like R that allow you to make very good graphs uh, relatively easily. The trick here is don't reinvent the wheel. There's lots of resources out there, so use them. And the final point is that one of those key resources is other people. One of the best ways to judge whether an image works is to ask other people what they think your image means. If they kind of get it, that's great. If not, you need to go back to the drawing board and change the things that uh, confuse people. There's a lot more to learn about visualization, but hopefully this seminar has given you a little bit of an appreciation of some of the main issues. Showing data in a visual form is a standard and common part of modern life. It just is going to help everyone if we manage to get it right.